Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Integrated DNA Technologies webinar on new RNA tools for optimized CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. My name is Dr. Hans Packer, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. The presentation today will be given by Ashley Jacoby. And Ashley is a research scientist here in the Molecular Genetics and Applied Research Group at IDT, where she has been for a little over nine years now. She is one of the key people leading CRISPR research here, and she has expertise in the use of technologies that use synthetic nucleic acids to alter gene expression in mammalian cells, including RNAi and antisense oligos. Ashley is a graduate of Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, and she is a native to Iowa, which is uh, where the headquarters of IDT is at. Ashley's presentation today should last about 40 minutes, and following that presentation, Ashley will answer your questions. As attendees, you've been muted, but we encourage you to ask your questions or make comments anytime during or after the presentation. And you can do that by typing them into the questions box, which is located at the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, you can just click the plus sign or the little up arrow, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC, and that'll make that window larger so you can type your questions into it. Uh, also, in case you need to leave early today for some reason or you want to revisit this webinar, we are recording the presentation and we'll make a link to that recording available a few days after the presentation on our website, which is uh, www.idtdna.com. And you'll find links to this video once we post it and other videos under the support and education tab. We also have a YouTube channel where we post webinars and other videos, which is www.youtube.com forward slash idtdnabio. The slides will be available to you immediately following the presentation on www.slideshare.net forward slash IDTDNA. And in case you miss any of those links, don't worry about it because you will be receiving a follow-up email with the, the links that I just mentioned, uh, as well as some additional information. Uh, so at this point, uh, that's all the housekeeping stuff I have. So let's just turn it over to Ashley so she can begin her talk. Ashley? Hello. Thank you, Hans. As Hans mentioned, I am a member of IDT's research and development team. So today I'm going to be discussing the work that we have done here at IDT with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and we'll be introducing the products that we will be launching later this month. I'm not going to go into some a lot of specific details on the history and background of the CRISPR-Cas system. We had a nice webinar on that earlier this year, which is available on our website, but rather I'm going to be discussing how to use these methods in your lab. There are two main components required to achieve editing via CRISPR-Cas9, the Cas9 protein and the CRISPR guide RNA. I'm using the CRISPR guide RNA as an umbrella term for the single guide RNA fusion system, as well as the two-part CRRNA tracer RNA system. And we'll be discussing strategies for combining different components throughout. A common method to deliver the Cas9 and guide RNA into your system is in one expression system, shown here, as a plasmid or a lentivirus, which is then transcribed and translated in the cell. But there are problems that can be associated with this method. So today we're going to showcase methods that deliver these components as individual components shown here for Cas9 and here for single guide RNA. And these individual components will be highlighted throughout. I will include these schematics as we go through the presentation to give you a good idea of the system that we're working in. So to give you a little bit of background of how some of the components of the CRISPR system functions, in the natural bacteria system, the guide RNA is, consists of two components, the CRRNA, which contains the target-specific region shown here in green, the 20 nucleotide, commonly called protospacer target-specific region, and then there's a portion that is complementary to the tracer RNA which forms a complex that Cas9 recognizes and directs to the target-specific region in the genome that is upstream the protospacer adjacent motif known as the PAM site, which is NGG and strep pyogenes Cas9. Cas9 recognizes this and makes a double-stranded break, typically three to four bases upstream of the PAM site. It's important when you're designing your guide RNA to contain, to make sure the guide RNA contains these 20 nucleotides directly upstream of the PAM site, but that the PAM is not contained on the guide RNA, rather it's the recognition site on the non-targeting strand in the genome. 
Over here is the single guide fusion trigger form. This was introduced in 2012 in this science publication where this was a construct that was simplified to use guide RNAs in an expression plasma because they could run off of one promoter. So there are two ways scientists would want to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system. One, to disrupt a gene by introducing a guide RNA and non-homologous end joining then repairing the NIC that that guide or the double-stranded break that that guide RNA caused. This method is error prone and results in some form of insertion deletion event occurring commonly referred to as an indel event which often results in knockout of the protein. The other pathway shown here involves ins inserting something into the genome and repairing by homology directed repair requiring use of a donor oligo. The work I'm going to discuss today is going to just focus on the non-homologous end joining pathway. So as mentioned, a common method for delivering the Cas9 and single guide RNA into the cells is using a full complete expression system. But the strep pyogenes Cas9 is a large protein which often resolves in a plasmid being very large typically from 7 to 10 kb in size. Delivering this large of a plasmid has very low and varying transfection efficiencies. So to truly assess the editing of your system using this delivery tool would require some sort of a sorting or enrichment for cells that actually took up this plasmid. The figure here on the right shows where we delivered a plasmid that was greater than 9 kb in size containing a single guide RNA and the Cas9 plasmid into cells. This, pla this vector also contained a GFP fluorescent reporter tag. And you can see here that only a small portion of the cells actually took up this size of a plasmid. But when you're delivering under the same conditions a plasmid that's slightly under 5 kb in size, you can see you have a much larger representation of the population that was successfully transfected. So this is a hurdle that needs to be dealt with. Our first work focused on wanting to optimize the CRISPR guide RNA portion of this system. So to do this, we decided to generate a that constitutively expressed Cas9, where every cell expressed Cas9 at a low level, so we didn't have inefficiencies of Cas9 delivery biasing our studies. We did verify through digital droplet PCR that we had a single Cas9 present in each cell. And on the right here is a Western blot image confirming that we have a low constant level of Cas9 present in our stable cell line. But we're also looking at Cas9 on a Western blot when the Cas9 was delivered as the Cas9 plus single guide RNA plasmid that I showed on the previous slide. This shows that there is actually a very high increasing level of Cas9 present when it's delivered as an expression plasmid, even though only a small percentage of the cells actually were transfected with this, successfully transfected. So this we're, there are hypotheses that this may not be the best way to deliver Cas9 and could actually contribute to some of the off-target effects that would be seen. There's, there are multiple ways to assess the gene editing that occurs from your guide RNA being introduced into cells with Cas9. One common method that is used that's a fairly cheap and reliable method is using the T7 endonuclease 1 mismatch detection, detection assay. This is going to assess for editing events via indel formation, which you can then represent as gene editing of your population. So here I'm going to give you a little bit of details of the system that we use at IDT to assess our gene editing. We introduce the guide RNA into cells that express Cas9. After 48 hours, we extract the genomic DNA from the population and then amplify up a region around the CRISPR site. We typically like to design PCR assays that are about 200 bases upstream in both directions where your guide RNA sequence, your 20 nucleotide sequence lies. We amplify up that region and then what is present in that region would be cells that, populations that were wild type and no editing events could occur, had occurred, and other populations where 
different insertion events or deletion events had occurred. So we amplify up this entire population and then heat and slowly cool those amplicons to allow for heteroduplex formation. When this happens, the strands are going to denature and re-anneal and wild type strands will anneal with mutated strands and bubbles will form similar to here. We then add T7 endonuclease 1, which is going to recognize any areas of non-homology and cut this double-stranded DNA. We then take this digestion reaction and visualize it on a gel or a fragment analyzer, which is a capillary electrophoresis automated gel system that I will go into more detail on the next slide. Um, but then these products are visualized out on a gel. So the first band that showed here is going to be your full length amplicon, so your wild type species, anything that was not cut by T7. And one thing to note here is that T7 doesn't accurately, doesn't reliably recognize one base mutation in DEL events. So here we're showing a one base deletion or insertion that T7 doesn't recognize. So those are going to be contained within your uncut, non-edited population when in fact there was an editing event. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the lower two bands are showing fragments where the, an indel event was detected right at approximately the size of where your guide RNA lies and you get two species of products that would add up to your full length product here. We then take the percentage of this population and correlate that back and have a percentage gene editing. To go into a little bit more detailed methods of the full process what at, that we use to assess gene editing and uh, the downstream mutation detection, we deliver uh, RNAs into cells that express Cas9 at a final concentration of 30 nanomolars, so this being, whether it being in vitro transcribed single guide RNA or synthetic RNA oligos, we deliver these in a 96 well plate format at a final concentration of 30 nanomolar, or we use a G-blocks gene fragment and deliver these as an expression system where more, the RNA is going to be made in the cell and this requires 3 nanomolar final amount. We wait 48 hours to extract the genomic DNA. We've done some time core studies that have shown 48 hours to be the optimal time point for cell culture based studies where both the editing events peak and plateau. So we take the genomic DNA after 48 hours using the quick extract DNA solution from Epicenter. We heat the genomic DNA extract and then amplify up the region of interest with kappa high fly polymerase using a PCR assay that we have validated that is designed around our, our target region of interest. We then directly take this PCR reaction, crude, and add NEB buffer 2 to the reaction and do the heteroduplex formation where we heat to 95 degrees and slowly cool the reaction, followed by adding T7E1 at 2 units for 30 and, and incubating at 37 degrees for an hour. This digestion reaction is then analyzed on a fragment analyzer, which is shown right here. The fragment analyzer is available from Advanced Analytical. It's a 96-channel capillary electrophoresis system that separates 96 samples at a time. It's very automated. You can run three plates at once. That's what these uh, door trays show, and this gives you very high resolution analysis of your fragments. You're able to resolve 10 bases out to 40,000 base pair fragments. This is a very rapid run. It takes an hour or so. This isn't, doesn't involve the process of running and making agarose gels. And you're actually able to get away with running one-tenth the amount of DNA that you would visualize on it, that you would need to visualize your products on an agarose gel. So we're actually able to reduce the components that were used in the PCR and digestion reactions. Here is an electropherogram view of a sample that was separated on the fragment analyzer. What we see is our, our full length amplicon here, which would be samples that were not cut by T7, and then we see the two cut products, which add up to equal the uncut product and the sizes correlate to where your guide RNA is within that amplicon. We're also given a table that gives us the molarity of the, the molarity of these peaks, and we then use the average molarity of these cut products divided by this, that average plus the molarity of the uncut product to get our percent cleavage, which we then correlate to the gene editing responsible by that guide RNA. 
So the first set of experiments we looked at, we used the single fusion, single guide RNA trigger form where it was everything was in one construct. And we, we delivered the SG RNA as GBLOX gene fragments. GBLOX gene fragments are a very inexpensive, high quality, double-stranded DNA fragment that can be synthesized and turned around very quickly. These range in size from 125 to 2,000 base pairs in length and are sequence verified. So to use a GBLOX gene fragment for CRISPR, one would design a fragment like this. You would require a U6 promoter or your promoter of choice sequence. In this case, we have a 265 base pair U6 promoter sequence, followed by your your protospacer sequence. So this is going to be your target specific region that you're hitting that precedes your PAM site that the customer would, would then input here, and followed by the single guide RNA fusion construct. In this case, this results in a 364 base pair expression cassette that would be directly synthesized and ordered from IDT. There are three ways you can then deliver that construct as a CRISPR tool. You can clone that construct into an expression plasmid and then deliver a plasmid to your cells. You can use that GBLOX gene fragment as a template for in vitro to generate an in vitro transcribed single guide RNA and directly transfect the RNA form of a single guide RNA. Or you can actually directly transfect the GBLOX into cells without needing to clone them at all. And IDT has some protocols and methods on our website that highlight how to directly transfect the GBLOX gene fragment into cells. AdGene has also published some work, some methods using GBLOX gene fragments by cloning them into expression plasmids and delivering that way. And there is also a paper out of the Church Lab that illustrated using GBLOX gene fragments for plasmid construction and delivering a single guide RNA. And we've currently sold over 14,000 GBLOX gene fragments for CRISPR, so people are using these and they, they do work. So here is our first uh, set of trying out GBLOX gene fragments uh, for CRISPR. Here we randomly chose, in this case, 15 different PAM sites in a region of HPRT and made guide RNAs by choosing the 20 nucleotide regions that were upstream to PAM, synthesizing these as a G-block, and delivered these into cells that stably express Cas9. So we're delivering the G-block gene fragment into cells that express Cas9. And we do this in biological triplicates. So here we are showing biological replicates of guide RNAs delivered as G-blocks across 15 different sequences. And we have done the T7 endonuclease 1 assay, and we're visualizing our digested products on either an agarose gel or the fragment analyzer. And what this is showing here is that there are the very similar trends between visualizing these on an agarose gel and the fragment analyzer, but the fragment analyzer actually provides us a more consistent quantification, allowing us to study many more sites and have high quality data that we would be able to train an algorithm to avoid sites like this that don't show any editing. And down here is the average editing we are seeing from the fragment analyzer when you take these biological triplicates um, into effect. So as I mentioned, the T7 endonuclease 1 assay does miss small changes like single base indels. So we wanted to sequence some of our edited populations and see if there was any sort of relationship between the editing we see with T7 and the editing when you sequence the entire population. So here we have amplicons that resulted in varying editive editing efficiencies from T7 that we cloned and Sanger sequenced. So here we are looking at a guide RNA that gave us 20% cleavage via T7, but when you sequence that population, you're actually seeing 40% of the population that was totally edited. And consistently, if you see, if we saw at T7 editing at about 40%, when we sequence the entire population, we are closer to actually 80%. So T7 does under-predict what, in what we've seen by about twofold, but it is still a very robust and the cheapest method to assay for gene disruption. But this is just something to keep in mind and what these numbers all mean. So now that we better understand what the T7 endonuclease 1 percentage means, and we have developed methods for high throughput screening of guide RNAs, we, have, we wanted to look at 
several GBLOX gene fragments for serving as the single guide RNA. So here we look at every possible PAM site in a 600 base pair region of three different exons that had varying GC percentages. We then ran the T7 endonuclease 1 assay. And here we have these plotted from lowest performing to highest performing. So these GBLOX were transfected into cells that stably expressed Cas9, and the editing percentage was measured via T7. So we have them showing here that they're if anything performed under 20%, this is kind of graying out, and everything above 20% is shown with this percentage here. So this would indicate that a, a good half, 40 to 50% of your population is fully edited if you're seeing 20% editing from T7. So what you can see here is that these single guide RNAs that were expressed from GBLOX gene fragments actually work very well, and these were just directly transfected without the need to clone these. And these have a very high hit rate, where in many of these targets, 90% of just the random sequence that was generated had very high editing efficiencies. So now we've shown that you can use a GBLOX gene fragment and disrupt gene editing via the non-homologous end joining pathway. Now, let's go back to nature and look at delivering guide RNAs as a two-RNA oligosystem, where you have a CRISPR RNA that is complex to a separate component, the tracer RNA. So here is a little bit more detail about the two constructs. Listed here on the left is a single guide RNA construct, which is typically 99 to 123 bases in length. The target specific region is at the beginning portion here, where it's followed by the single guide RNA fusion. So if you wanted to directly deliver this as a synthetic RNA, this is near the chemical limit for reliable chemical manufacturing. It would actually be quite expensive because it would require high quality purification, and it would require you to make a new 99 plus base construct every time because your customs, every time you wanted to look at a new target sequence. But this form is very amenable and very affordable if you're wanting to use this as a GBLOX gene fragment and deliver it as a DNA into the cell that is then made, as the RNA is then transcribed in the cell. But if you do want to directly transfect or deliver the, your guide RNA in RNA form, what about synthesizing the two different strands and then complexing them together? So naturally, the, the CRRNA is 42 bases, and this contains the target-specific region here, the 20 nucleotides that are going to have homology to your genome. The tracer RNA then would be the universal piece, and this could be made in bulk, making this more affordable and be of a high quality, where you would then just need to order, every time you wanted to look at a new site, this this smaller RNA strand. But we started to wonder, are nature sizes optimal? Could shorter, shortening these strands could reduce purification needs and result in a higher quality synthetic RNA, RNA product? So we looked into truncating both the CRISPR and tracer RNA. So we shortened the tracer RNA, bringing this in flush with the CRISPR RNA, and then further shortened this construct, and even further shortened the construct. And we're actually very impressed with how short we could go before we start, got to a point where this didn't work. And we actually saw that we had improved functionality, as well as improved synthetic RNA yields and quality. So here we did pairwise combinations of our shortened CRISPR RNA and shortened tracer RNA, and found that when we used the the optimal shortened CRISPR RNA with the tracer RNA, we got the best functional results. And the long tracer RNA seemed to be what was responsible for having lower indel form formation. But there was a point where this got worse. So here is the actual data from the link studies that I've just been discussing. So here we looked at one guide RNA and made different lengths of the CR RNA and different lengths of the tracer RNA. And in these cases, we are always pairing the CRISPR RNA with the tracer RNA in equal molar amounts. So here we're looking at different length combinations in our Cas9 stable cell line where we're delivering this CR RNA, tracer RNA complex. So the native length right here, which is a 42 CR RNA complex to an 89 nucleotide tracer RNA, is giving us about 25% T7 editing. 
And you can see though, as we change the length, what we've actually found to be optimal is a 36 nucleotide CRISPR RNA duplex to a 67 nucleotide tracer RNA, where this gave improved functionality as well as improved RNA synthesis and is giving us a good 60% editing here, which correlates to our entire population being edited. So now that we've optimized a two-part RNA oligo system, we wanted to take a look at this being, we wanted to compare this to other RNA trigger forms. So we took a set of 12 HPRT guide RNAs, a random set of guide RNAs that are in our HPRT amplicon, and delivered these into our Cas9 cells as different forms. So we delivered the IDT optimized shortened two-part RNA system. We also delivered the long native RNA system, which is 4289. We delivered an in vitro transcribed single guide RNA that was made off of a G block. So we're directly transfecting the RNA here. We've delivered a expression plasmid that just has the single guide RNA, and then we've also delivered a G block gene fragment expression cassette. And here we're delivering these at different final amounts because we've optimized and determined the maximal efficiency for each of these different components. And what those values are, are a final concentration of 30 nanomolar when you're directly delivering RNA, whether it be a two-part RNA, short or long, or an in vitro transcribed RNA. When we're delivering a, a plasmid, we are using a final amount of 100 nanograms. And when we're delivering the G-block gene fragment, which is that the RNA is then expressed in the cell, we're able to get away with using uh, only 3 nanomolar. And these are all being delivered into our cells that ex express Cas9. So as you can look across here, you can see right away that not all RNA triggers are given the same amount of editing. Some cases, a guide RNA will, regardless of the construct you use for the single guide RNA, will give you the same percentage editing in a couple of cases here and here and these. But there are many cases where there are very stark differences between the, mes the methods that you use to deliver your guide RNA. But what does stand out is that the IDT optimized two-part system is very superior in all cases. Next, we looked into the purification that would be nece necessary for making these different length RNA oligos. So we are looking at the same set of 12 HPRT guide RNAs, 12 different sequences here, and studying the oligo purification requirements. The CRISPR RNA portion in all cases was a, just a standard desalt purification. This length, that's all that's necessary we result in a very good quality product. But we did compare for the longer tracer RNA using a standard desalt purification compared to an HPLC purification for both the long and short constructs. And here now when we look at the T7 editing efficiencies, we can see again in this set of experiments that the short co constructs are outperforming the long constructs by quite a bit, actually. Um, but also that the the HPLC purification of the tracer has some slight improvements that we see with the 67 nucleotide construct, but major improvements with the longer construct. So these longer RNAs do require a, a very high quality purification. Now IDT will be launching our two-part RNA, RNA oligo system later this month, and we will be providing you with a CRISPR RNA, which will be 36 nucleotides in length. If this will be your custom sequence, that will be a desalted RNA oligo, and this could be ordered in the thousands because you have the ability to order these in 96 well plate format. They will be provided at two or 10 nanomoles. We will also then be providing a tracer RNA as the 67 nucleotide construct. This will be an HPLC purified RNA oligo that will be made in bulk. You can order this and pair with all of your different custom CRISPR RNAs. The tracer RNA is modified for nuclease stability and will be available at 520 or 100 nanomoles. At IDT, every oligo is guaranteed to be of high quality, and we, you are given these QCs that show you the mass spec or purity of your oligos. So, and 
the, the trace on the left is the IDT tracer RNA. This is a mass spectrophotometer trace of the 67 nucleotide tracer RNA. So you can see a nice uh, single peak product here. Uh, on the right is a tracer RNA that we ordered from a different vendor. And you can see there's a lot of different truncated versions here. Synth synthesis of RNA oligos is, is difficult, so it's important to check the quality of your long RNAs if you're ordering them in synthetic form. Now that we've identified an optimized two-part system, we wanted to study this across many sites and assess if there is an immediate need for on -target, an on-target design tool, as well as generate very high-quality data where we can work on the need for a design tool. So here we did a walk of the same 300 sites that we looked at with GBLOX, but expanded this to over 553 sites. So we're looking at six different exons with varying GC percentages, and we've again marked off areas that had below 20% total editing and given you the percentage that was above 20%. So what you can see here is that by just doing a random walk of PAM sites, we have a very, very high hit rate. Many of these regions have greater than 90% of the sites that gave very efficient gene editing. So right now, we're initially launching, at our initial launch, it will require manual entry of your 20 nucleotide guide sequence we just suggest ordering a couple different sites, and you're likely to have one that's going to give you a very good hit rate. But we are actively developing algorithms that will help weed out these areas that uh, gave you poor performance. And our approach for an algorithm is to look broadly across, across several genes and find sites that are most potent, which is useful for both protein knockout by non-homologous end joining, but it's also useful for addition of templates by the homology-directed repair. But what is the most important thing to think about when ordering these is to look into off-target effects. So we are also developing rules that will help reduce the likelihood of off-target effects, and there are also tools out there now to use um, to minimize your risk of off-target effects. So here is a summary of the, the previous graphs I just showed you where we looked at the two-part RNA functional performance and looking at 553 sites, 86% of these had greater than 20% editing. So this is a very, very solid hit rate. Here we're directly comparing for the 300 sites that we looked at as both GBLOX gene fragments to the two-part RNA. And the first set of images has these plotted in blue, the two-part RNA system and in red, the G-block, and these are plotted from lowest performing to highest performing. So these aren't necessarily the same sequence in this case. These are just showing the trends of the two systems and the percentage that was above 20%. So as you look across, both of these have a very high hit rate, and there are some cases when the G-block is performing better and cases where the two-part is performing better, but they all have very good hit rates. And the second panel is where we're plotting the two part in lowest performing to highest performing and then have paired this with the same sequence as a G block. So you can see there's a lot of differences on how these perform. There are some cases where the G block performs better than the two part, but then there are cases where, like here, where the two part performed better. So we're trying to understand this better and potentially have an algorithm that could address this. But regardless, both forms have a high percentage of giving greater than 50% total editing. So your likelihood of ordering two or three guide RNAs will be likely that you'll have a significant indel event. And the most important thing is to look into limiting your off-target effects. Here we are showcasing that not only can the editing efficiencies be different via T7, but the actual profiles of the editing events can be different. And let me give you some examples of why. So here we took a guide RNA targeting one site in HPRT that was delivered as different RNA triggers, and we took the amplicon and sequenced the entire population to get an idea of the editing events that were happening. So here we're looking at a GLOC single guide RNA that was delivered to Cas9 expressing cells, where we saw, in this case, 40% editing via T7. When we sequenced the population, we actually saw 75% of the population was, was, that was edited. So this goes back to that T7 missing some changes and being roughly twofold under predicting. 
But if we take a deeper look at the editing events that happened from delivering a GBLOX gene fragment, we see we saw a quarter of the percentage that was still wild type that didn't have any editing events. We saw a portion that had some multi-base deletions. But then we saw this large portion here that had a one base insertion. So we know T7 can't reliably recognize one base event, so that accounts for, likely accounts for the difference between the 40 and 75%. But another large portion that was shown is, was these large multi-base insertions that actually tracked back to the expression construct that was put in, so the DNA that was initially used to generate the RNA being integrated. And we saw a very almost identical profile when we looked at delivering another expression-based system where 30% was detected from T7, but edit, when you assessed the full um, sequencing, we saw 70%, and there was a large portion that was very large insertions that mapped back to DNA that was present from the um, expression plasma that was delivered. Here, when we looked at the editing events that occurred from delivering the two-part RNA, we saw 50% from T7, and 70% when we, again, when we uh, assess the full population. So a quarter of these were wild type, and a large portion had multi-base deletions. There was, again, a, per a percentage that had one base insertion, so that likely accounts for the difference here. And then we just saw some other random, mu random mutation events, nothing that was integrated from um, the construct because this was not introduced as DNA. And the last image is where we put the complete system that had the Cas9 and guide RNA into native 293 cells and only saw 10% editing. We didn't do any sort of enrichment or sorting. We know that not many of the cells actually take this up, so that's why a large portion of this was wild type. So next we looked at changing lengths of the target-specific region, the protospacer, which is typically 20 bases in length, because there was a paper that was published that indicated using a 17 nucleotide protospacer could reduce off-target effects. So here we looked at our same HPRT-12 sites and synthesized the, them as our IDT two-part RNA system with the guide-specific region being 20 nucleotides, 19, 18, or 17. And you can see here that although the 17 nucleotide uh, protospacer may reduce off-target effects, it greatly reduced the on-target effects. There wasn't much difference seen between a 19 or 20 base protospacer region, but in these sequences there was, in some cases, a very strong reduction in on-target activity when this was synthesized with 18 nucleotides compared to using a 17 nucleotide protospacer region. So that's just something to keep in mind. So a common method to avoid DNA integration is to introduce your single guide RNA directly as an RNA via in vitro transcribed RNAs. So here we wanted to compare in vitro transcribed single guide RNAs. So this is the fusion one construct that was made off of a DNA template to our two-part synthetic RNA oligosystem. So to generate these, you're going to have to order a DNA template, which a G-block works nice for. And then you have to do the in vitro transcription reaction. But some additional problems can occur. It's, you need to make, a sh make sure that you've removed all your template DNA. It's difficult to QC that, that you did efficiently remove everything. And yields can vary with IDTs from day to day. So this is just some important things to keep in mind. And one other thing that you can see here is that cells were, are often very sensitive to delivery of in vitro transcribed RNAs. This particular set here, which was synthesized with this kit, resulted in very large-scale cell death. When we switched to use a different, using a different in vitro transcription kit, we did have cells that were much healthier. So we carried through with our experiments using this system and comparing to our two-part RNA oligosystem, which uh, did not result in any unhealthy cells. So here is a functional comparison via the T7 assay using the 12 sites and HPRT delivered as a two-part RNA oligosystem or an in vitro transcribed single guide RNA into Cas9 cells. And you can see there the two constructs are very similar in some sites, but then there are many sites too that the uh, two-part RNA was superior. 
So even though the in vitro transcribed single guide RNAs worked and were functional and using the alternative kit had healthy cells, these did actually trigger the cell's innate immune response. So long synthetic RNAs, IVTs can have been known to invoke a cell's uh, innate immune response. And we looked into this by isolating total RNA from cells that expressed Cas9 and were treated with either a two-part RNA oligosystem or the in vitro transcript. And after 24 hours, isolated the RNA and measured expression of genes that are commonly overexpressed when a cell is under stress via qPCR. So this first panel, we measured expression of the human SFRS9 transcript, which is our common normalizer gene that doesn't fluctuate much. So here we're showing that when we looked at cells that were not treated with anything, cells that were treated with 12 different two-part RNA oligos, CRISPR tracer RNA constructs, and 12 that were treated with different 12 different IVT single guide RNAs, that all of they all had the same expression of this normalizer target. However, when we look at a transcript that is known to be overexpressed when a cell is under an immune response, in this case IFIT1, our, the basal level of this transcript is shown here with untreated cells. And all 12 of the different two-part sequences we looked at are right at the same level as the cells only. However, all 12 in vitro transcribed single guide RNAs have a 500-fold induction of this target. And we saw similar high inductions when we looked at additional transcripts such as IFITM1, RIG-I, and OAS2. And we saw the same effect regardless of if we removed the triphosphate that um, is generated. We've never seen an induction with our two-part two RNA system. Okay, so now back to the Cas9 problem, the Cas9 delivery problem. All the experiments that I have shown you so far have been using our, stable, our cells that stably express Cas9. Now this stable cell line works great and has allowed us to very effectively optimize the guide RNA portion, but this is limiting you to one cell type. So how can we now try working with several other cell types? So here's another example where we've tried delivering the combined expression plasmid into cells and have pretty poor uptake compared to a smaller plasmid. So one slightly improved solution would be to use a smaller vector. IDT does have a minimal vector that we've put Cas9 into, which ends up being 7.3 kb. It essentially has an origin of replication, an ampicillin resistance, and no selection marker. So you can deliver this into cells followed by delivery of your two-part RNA. And this has improvements in editing, but there are still other plasmid-associated problems that remain, integration events and the overexpression of Cas9 specifically. So we next looked into delivery of the CRISPR guide RNA plus Cas9 protein as a ribonuclear protein complex. There have been some publications that have come out showcasing the importance and ease of delivering these directly delivering these constructs as directly as a CRISPR guide RNA fused to a Cas9 protein. So this is a simple, fast, and robust delivery method where it requires complexing your guide RNA to your Cas9 protein and delivering this directly to cells using lipofection or electroporation. This is our preferred method of delivery because of these reasons below. Um, this allows protection of your RNA. Your RNAs aren't waiting around in the cell for Cas9 to be made, which risks degradation. This has a higher editing event compared to plasmid delivery. There's no DNA present, so you don't have the integration events happening. You, you have very tight control of Cas9. It's not being expressed at a very high level in your cell. It's a on-off event and then gone. Nothing is present in the cell that can make more. So we assume this would likely reduce off-target effects that could be associated from extra Cas9 being present. And there's also a reduced risk of mosaicism in animal embryo studies. So here is our same set of HPRT guide RNAs that we, where we are comparing the RNP system to our Cas9 cell line where every cell contains Cas9. So 
we are here delivering the 12 HPRT guide RNAs as a two-part RNA system that's either complex to the Cas9 protein or delivering this into cells that stably express Cas9. And you can see across here that these are, there is virtually no difference in efficiencies of these two systems. The RMP system is working very robustly. We're actually able to get away with using less guide RNA. In this case, when we're working in a 96 well plate format, we're delivering 30 nanomolar of the two-part RNA into the Cas9 cells with a lipid, but we are generating a complex of the guide RNA at 10 nanomolar to 10 nanomolar Cas9 protein and delivering that. If we did look at this at 30 nanomolar, we saw the same level, whereas if we dropped this down to 10, it was markedly reduced. So you're able to get away with using a little bit less as well and see the same efficiencies. We have successfully tested the RNP delivery system in other cell lines. Here is an example where we are delivering 10 different guide RNAs targeting mouse factor 9 into AML12 cells. And you can see here that 9 out of the 10 that we studied gave a very high percent gene editing. So in conclusion, we have shown that the synthetic RNA oligos mimic the natural two-part CRISPR system function well in mammalian cells, both when Cas9 is expressed in the target cell or when it's complex to the Cas9 protein and delivered as a ribonuclear protein complex. We have shown you an optimized shortened CRISPR tracer RNA complex that has shown improved editing activity and improved synthesis. We have highlighted how in vitro transcribed single guide RNAs can risk immune activation, so it's important to keep in mind what else is happening to your cell when you're introducing these constructs. And we have shown that the two-part system and G-block gene fragments both give a very high positive hit rate in many gene walks, where this suggests that site selection algorithms may not be needed for many applications as long as you test multiple sites. So coming soon, IDT will be offering these products. As mentioned, the custom CRISPR CRRNA will be available as a 36 nucleotide construct at 2 and 10 nanomoles. This will also be available in plate format. The tracer RNA will be available as a bulk HPLC purified 67 nucleotide construct at 520 and 100 nanomoles. And we will also be offering control kits that will be very useful if you are new to CRISPR and want to get your system up and running, as well as if you're wanting to validate your existing system. The kits will contain everything you need to get your experiment going except the Cas9 construct. And we will be initially offering our, mi our minimal vector that has Cas9 present, but we are also adding to our product line Cas9 protein soon so you can directly deliver the RMP complex. The control kits will be human, mouse, and rat specific, and will contain a validated CRISPR RNA targeting HPRT in all three species. It will also contain a CRISPR RNA negative control that has been bioinformatically shown to not have any homology to areas in the human, mouse, and rat genome. And we will also provide you with the primary mixes necessary to amplify up your region that you CRISPRed with these positive controls. And finally, a, we are working on a design tool, but I hope I have convinced you of the high hit rate of the synthetic RNA and G-block system, and that the most important thing is to try to assess your off-target effect potential. So I'd like to thank you for listening today, and if you have any questions about setting up your experiments, feel free to contact us by web chat, email, or phone. We're always here to help get you guys going. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that presentation, Ashley. That was great. A lot of good information there. Um, also, if you have any questions right now, if you haven't already done so, you can uh, ask Ashley your questions by typing them into the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And it has a little up arrow or a plus sign. You can just click on that, make the window larger, and type your question into that. And I will read as many of those to Ashley as I can uh, starting right now. So uh, let's just go to the beginning here, Ashley. There's a couple of questions about... Uh, the getting the individual components into cells. So how is the transfection done for the uh, the RNA constructs? So for the RNA constructs, what we do is we are delivering these through lipofection, but you can also use electroporation. 
we are transfecting these into cells that express Cas9 or complexing to the Cas9 protein and directly delivering that into cells using a lipid transfection reagent that works best for your cell type of interest. And can you just say a little bit about the methods for how the uh, Cas9 was introduced into the HEC293 cells? Yes, we delivered that using a Cas9 expression plasma that had a selectable marker that we then selected for, so every cell would be expressing Cas9 under selection, and then verified the presence of Cas9 through Western blot and through digital drop PCR. This is generated through limited cell dilutions. And we screened several different populations that had different high and low events of Cas9 and settled on this constant low level of expression that had one copy of Cas9. Okay. Um, I suppose this question could be for either the two-part RNA or the G-Blox gene fragments, but uh, this person is ask, asking specifically about G-Blox gene fragments. Does IDT offer help for customers to design a CRISPR G-Blox gene fragment for a given gene? We don't currently have a design tool up for designing your CRISPR G-Blox, but we could could absolutely help with designing that. We just need to know the promoter sequence that you're wanting to use and the target specific region you're wanting to sequence or you're wanting to edit. And then we could just give them some guidance, it. sure. Yep. Um, so the, the best way to do that would be to email like uh, the on the previous slide it says that there's an email address for application support Yes. at the bottom of that slide. So you could email that address and they, they'd be able to answer your question. Uh, let's see here. So this is a basic science question. I, I think that maybe this person just missed the initial slide. Can you just explain what the relationship is again between the tracer RNA versus the CR RNA? Yes, let me go up to that beginning slide. So, so the CRRNA is what contains the target-specific region that is going to have homology to your genome. This has a complementary region that is going to bind to the tracer RNA. Cas9 then recognizes this complex, and this construct is guided to the area in the genome that is, that is homology to the protostracer sequence contained in your CRISPR RNA that precedes an NGG when you're using strep pyogenes Cas9 on the non-targeting strand. Okay. Ashley, can you just go ahead and tell them um, what the transfection reagent is that we typically use for the two-part RNA system? Yes. Um, we are currently using RNA IMAX for delivery of our RNA constructs. We use Transit X2 from Miris for delivery of our plasmid constructs. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to a question about the T7E1 assay. And the question for the T7 assay is, if the T7 assay underreports by twofold, then what are you seeing when you get 70 or 80% editing? And they want to know if that twofold is uh, like the same in all cases. Yeah, we, I mean, we need to sequence a lot more to, to know that. But we're kind of maxing. We know that we're when we have sequenced events that are at 70%, we are seeing virtually 98% of the editing of the population being completely edited. So it's essentially plateaus off where more than 50% T7 editing your full population is, is very edited. So I know we don't have any data for this right now. Um, do we have any examples of the data that we've shown here for the two-part RNA system in primary cells of any type? And this person specifically is mentioning primary fibroblasts. We don't have any examples here, but I have heard a lot of positive feedback from our beta test sites that have used this in primary cells, the two-part RNA oligosystem. Okay. All right, so this next question, when you're comparing your editing efficiency, is, does part of that analysis include a consideration that the transfection efficiency may be very different when using short RNA oligos versus long RNA versus DNA constructs? Well, 
Is uh, transaction efficiency figured into that editing efficiency yes. at all? Yes. Well, we're always running a positive control to make sure the transaction was at optimal level and wouldn't take data that was a suboptimal transaction efficiency and have developed the most optimal methods for each construct, if that answers anything. Yeah, I think it does, um, <laughs> hopefully. I mean, uh, you, you want to have a positive transfection control to assure that you're, you know what that looks like when you're under an efficient transfection reaction and de develop the most optimal amounts required to get you maximum efficiency for whatever construct you're delivering. And those amounts do vary depending on how you're delivering your guide RNA or what construct you're using to deliver your guide RNA. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's see here. This question, they're wondering if we've ever been able to alter all of the alleles of a gene in a hyperdiploid cell line. That is not something I have looked into, so I can't comment on that. Yeah, it's uh, we can we can follow up with that person by email. Yeah, we can follow up and look into that, but I have not done that. So have we compared the two-part RNA system to a lentiviral system uh, in a, in a hard-to-transfect cell type? I have not done any direct comparisons to a lentiviral system. I think there are you know, different reasons you would want to use one over the other. A lentiviral system could be more like a whole genome approach, but the two-part system would be knowing you're actually studying a specific event and figuring out what happens based on a specific site and a specific gene that you're editing. Okay. So we've commented on this a little bit. Uh, how do you prove that the phenotype that you're seeing is not due to some off-target effect? How would we analyze off-target effects for our, for our system? There is a lot of work being done to assess off-target effects, and we are very actively studying that and hope to have some support in that soon. Um, you, you do need to look at how to reduce off-target effects. There's tools. We specifically like the MIT Broad tool that helps identify sites that are most sensitive to have if there's a mismatch present. But you need a way to go in without having to do a whole genome sequencing to pull down where your your guide RNA is hit, and we're working on developing methods like that. There's a, a method called GuideSeq that is very promising for looking at something like that. Do you have any insight as as to what uh, like reviewers at journals might expect for off-target, at least discussion or controls? I know we look at a lot of these papers, but I I, I guess I don't have like a clear view of that. I'm I don't. It's obviously going to be very important when you're going into therapeutics because you're making a permanent change. So it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. And if you're doing anything therapeutic and you know methods are being developed to assess that, I don't know what a reviewer is going to require, though. Okay. Uh, some specific questions here about... Um, has anybody used this system in zebrafish at all? Do we have anybody that's like an early adopter that's tried it in zebrafish? I am not 100% sure on that. We have we have a lot of beta test sites out there, and I'm not sure if anyone is looking at this in zebrafish yet. I have to follow up and look at my communications to answer that effectively. Okay. So this person's asking, they're using an in vitro transcribed single guide RNA as part of a ribonucleoprotein complex, and then they inject it into embryos. Do you think replacing their IVT sgRNA with the two-part RNA would increase efficiency? I think it's definitely worth something directly comparing. There's many benefits to using the two-part system. I haven't directly looked at this in embryos, but 
I know we've got some beta test sites that have been very happy with delivering this as an RMP two-part micro-injection, so I would absolutely try it out. Okay. Um, so when would you need the, the, the GBLAX gene fragment system for CRISPR-Cas9? The GBLAX gene fragment would be would be really nice if you're, it's, it's a very inexpensive way to quickly see if you're disrupting your target sequence and if your guide RNA sequence is effective. You can, do, you can order it very quickly for, I believe, $89 and directly transfect that into your cells and know if, if your guide RNA is giving a disruption event. That's when I would choose to use that. For the size G block gene fragment that they would need, it's a... Uh... It is $89 for that in U.S. currency, so that's an important stipulation there. But yes, g block gene fragments, 500 base pairs, $89. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Another question about the off-target rate. D do we have any idea about whether or not the two-part RNA system has a higher off-target rate? We do not have any indication of that, and I would not expect it to. I think what's going to be more of the driver in the off-target effects is how you deliver your Cas9, whether it be as a, a plasmid that is going to continually be driven in your cell as opposed to protein that's going to rapidly have a short half-life and be degraded quickly. I think that's going to be more of the driving component of having more off-target effects than the RNA compo um, portion, but I don't have empirical data proving that. I'm going to put these two next things together. Um, somebody was asking how big of a thing, if we've, if we've tried to insert anything into uh, a, a location in the genome by homology-directed repair, and mm -hmm. how big, and then somebody else is asking if we offer plasmids or single-stranded oligos for templates for homology-directed repair. Yes, I don't have any data showing that today, but the two-part system is compatible with using that as your guide RNA and introducing a donor oligo. Um, we are actively studying the optimal best way to deliver the donor oligo for homology-directed repair, but there are different different ways. You can order a, you can use a G block to deliver. So if you want to go up to 2,000 base pairs of an insert, you can use a G block. We also have a single-stranded Ultramer product that works well for a, the donor oligo and homology-directed repair. We do not sell plasmids for that purpose, though. Okay. Um, I do want to comment at this point. Um, we are uh, we're just a little bit past the top of the hour, so I know that some people may need to go. If you haven't gotten your, an your answer, your question answered yet, and you do need to leave, know that we will be contacting you, and uh, we uh, will follow up with you on the question that you asked. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about this product when it launches and everything, there's a little post-webinar survey. Just make sure to quick fill that out really quickly and let us know that you want to be contacted afterwards. You will get an email if you've attended today just giving you the links to this webinar recording and uh, the slide deck. So if you're looking for any of that stuff, that will come to you. But if you want to be contacted about the product itself, just let us know that by filling out that survey. Um, we'll take a couple more questions, though. So... Uh, here's a question. Um, are the RNA constructs that we will have available, are they specific for mammalian cells? Well, that, I, no. Um, I mean, it's going to be specific for the strep pyogenes Cas9, so systems that that is going to recognize. So as long as you can express your Cas9 in the cells. So if you're using mammalian cells, you need a Cas9 with a mammalian promoter versus bacteria where you'd need a bacterial promoter, et cetera. Right. All right. Let's see here. Uh, here's a basic CRISPR question. Does the PAM sequence have to be on the opposite strand at the three prime end of the guide RNA? But you need to find a PAM site and the bases upstream of that, yes, are going to be what you want to design your guide RNA on. It's on the non-targeting strand where here your guide RNA is going to be complementary to the other strand. 
Right. If you're looking at it in a reverse orientation, you would then look for an NCC if you were wanting to find the region to target there. And another thing that's really important to note from this is that the, when you make your guide RNA sequence, a common error is that people sometimes put the PAM sequence in there with mm -hmm. their 20 bases, and you don't want to do that. Uh, when we have the tool up for the actual product release, we'll have uh, some some examples of how to do this correctly and what not to do to make this work easily for you. Absolutely. Uh, another question here. So does the surveyor nuclease have the same uh, weakness as T7 and endonuclease for the one base mismatch? So surveyor does work similar to T7E1 for mismatch de uh, detection. The surveyor actually does recognize single base mismatches better than T7. The reason, though, that we have chosen to use T7 is because it's more amenable to high throughput, so to look at many sites like we are interested in doing. Uh, T7, you can take your PCR reaction and directly digest that with, with T7. It doesn't require a purification step, but surveyor is a lot more sensitive to the different PCR components and does require a purification step. So if you're just looking at, you know, a couple of sites, yes, use use Surveyor, purify your PCR product, and that's going to give you, it's going to reliably detect more of your mismatches, but the T7 is a, a you know, more high throughput amenable route. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I think most of the rest of these you've addressed. There are still a few questions left, but um, like I said, we're kind of past the top of the hour here. So I just want to, um, I'm going to wrap this up. I just want to let people know, like I said, you'll be getting links to the recordings and everything. The slides are already available to you, which is www.slideshare.net forward slash IDT DNA. Um, so you can get the slides right away. The recordings will come to you very soon by email. And uh, yeah, I think that that's all of that. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank Ashley for her great presentation. I want to thank everybody for your questions. Like I said, we'll follow up with you if you didn't get your questions answered. And uh, yeah, Ashley, you want to say anything else? Nope. Thank you for tuning in today and let us know if you have any questions. Thanks everyone for participating. We'll, we'll be talking to you soon.